In a world ruled by emotion, where reason is abandoned, God is forsaken, and history forgotten, two brave men will attempt to do the unthinkable. Use their brains. Armed with ancient wisdom, they will bring light into our modern world. This is the Sons of Antiquity Podcast. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Sons of Antiquity Podcast. I'm your host, Evan, and I'm joined in the studio by my co-host, Dan. What's up, everybody? Today, we're going to be talking about something very important, very serious, beer. And what better way to start off an episode all about beer than by cracking open a cold one with the boys? Let's do it. Oh, yeah. Gotta love that sound. Yeah, man. Give her a try real good yeah we are currently drinking foster's lager i believe it is an australian beer one of my favorites and we're drinking from the large 25 ounce can also referred to as the chode can (laughs) Uh, one of my personal favorites for party time and now for doing the podcast so evan tell us what we're gonna be covering today all right today we're going to say first what is beer what are the different types how is beer made what are the effects? How do these effects differ from other alcohol? A little debate, maybe. What about ancient and pre-industrial beer production? The history of prohibition efforts? Modern beer production, and how does that differ from the ancient? Most produced beers throughout the world and statistics on drinking. The emergence of craft beers and home brewing. The morality of drinking alcohol and which religions ban it. Our favorite beers. Is beer the best alcoholic beverage? Another mini debate. All right. So what is beer and what are the different types? Beer is an alcoholic beverage usually made from malted cereal grain flavored with hops and brewed by slow fermentation. Historically, ale and beer were not synonymous. Ale was brewed without hops. Since the 19th century, yeast has been an ingredient, the major ingredient. While the basic of beer has only four ingredients, Brewers can add a variety of other ingredients. Uh, Other grains, such as corn, rice, and wheat, can be utilized besides uh, barley. If you see a beer called Vit Beer, it's made of wheat. Budweiser uses barley malt and rice for its signature flavor. Other sugars can be added for a smoother drink uh, without a lower alcohol content. This includes regular sugar, honey, and caramelized sugars, to name a few. Any spice is also an option especially in seasonal flavors. You know I like that Oktoberfest uh, by Sam Adams. And uh, I'm sure there are some white girls out there in the audience that love a pumpkin spice beer. Maybe, maybe not. Who knows? Fruits and vegetables are a rare ingredient, but are finding a home in the craft brew movement. Beer can be split between lagers and ales, which use different types of yeast. Lagers ferment at cold temperatures with the yeast at the bottom instead of at the top. Lagers tend to be crisp, dry, and thirst-quenching. Types include pale, pilsner, amber, and dark. Pilsners have the famous pale gold color and uh, go well with fried food, probably why Americans love them so much. Ambers are darker, and dark beers are, well, the darkest. Types of ale include cream, pale, amber, India pale ale, dark, brown, wheat, Belgian style, stouts, and porters. IPAs are very bitter. It would take forever to go over all the differences and uh, the perfect pairings of each, but we'll let you do your own research for that. How is beer made? The basic ingredients of beer are water, grains, hops, and yeast. The steps in order of brewing beer are milling, mashing, laudering, boiling, cooling, fermentation, and conditioning. Before starting, sterilize all your equipment. Very important, otherwise you might kill yourself. Then take the malt and crush it some. This gives more surface area of grain for more beer production, while leaving the husk for more filtration. So if you crush it entirely, you like the husk will be broken off. The way it is, when you just crush it some, you're leaving more surface area, but you're leaving the husk on to like kind of keep the big pieces of wheat from escaping into the mix. Oh, I see. So that's where the filtration kind of comes in. It well, keeps it from escaping, you're saying? There's, there'll still be some you have to filter out, but it keeps a lot of it out when you leave the husk on. Ah, Steep the milled grains in water at about 150 degrees Fahrenheit for an hour to an hour and a half, making sure not to add too much water. It should be pretty thick at this point. 
Steeping the grains, or mashing, extracts the sugars from the grain. The sugars are what will be fermented to make beer later. Next, separate the sugars from the grains to produce the wort. Boil the wort for at least an hour to sterilize the mixture, darken the beer, and improve the flavor. While boiling, add the hops. The hops add bitterness to counter the sweetness of the wort and some flavor, flavor and aroma. Cool the wort to fermentation temperature as quickly as possible. Add yeast and make sure to keep the temperature within the range that your particular yeast tolerates. Ferment for a few days or a few weeks, depending on what you want. Fermentation creates carbon dioxide, alcohol, and other flavors. Store the beer at a cold temperature to cause the yeast to sink, then filter it out. Finally, making good beer is hard, but making beer itself is not that difficult. Research proven methods and techniques, and also do some trial and error for best results. Yeah, it's probably going to take you a few times to get it to where you're you're starting to get it right. So don't give up. Don't get discouraged. You know, try and try again. Now, what are the effects of beer? Do these effects differ from other alcohol? When it comes down to it, alcoholism doesn't depend on which type of alcohol is consumed. The main difference between beer, wine, and liquor, besides taste, is alcohol content. Most beers range from 4 to 10 percent alcohol content. The lower end has a lot of light beers in it. Uh, most beers are around 5 percent. Compare that to wine at 12 percent and liquor at 40 percent. In other words, it takes a much larger volume of beer compared to other alcohol to get drunk. The U.S. government advises that drinking more than two drinks a day for men or one drink a day for women means you may have a drinking problem. According to the National Institute on Alcohol Abuse and Alcoholism, alcohol is involved in 30% of suicides, 40% of fatal burns, 50% of drownings, 50% of homicides, and 65% of fatal falls, as well as 29% of traffic fatalities. In addition to these immediate impacts, alcohol is linked to liver disease, breast cancer, cardiovascular diseases, depression, stomach bleeding, can cause diabetes, high blood pressure, and can worsen sleep disorders. And obviously, it can cause birth defects as well in pregnant women who consume alcohol. People say I have a drinking problem, but I don't have a problem drinking at all. Oh, nice. <laughs> That's a country song. Oh, okay. I didn't realize. I thought that was maybe like a reference to that scene in uh, Airplane where he's like got a drinking problem. He just throws the water on his face. I don't I don't remember. What about more fun effects of beer, though? Uh, let's not you know dwell on some of the, the heavier topics. Let's also cover some of the lighter ones. Uh, we're not telling you to give it up, alcohol, unless you're an alcoholic, of course. At that point, go get some help, please. Beer tends to make users more relaxed, unlike spirits, which have a tendency to make them more aggressive in some cases. But upon further evaluation, it seems like correlation does not mean causation. Heavy drinkers tend to drink spirits so that they can get drunk faster. Makes sense. And heavy drinkers tend to be violent in many cases. So we must take any pseudoscientific study, quote-unquote, with a grain of salt. In Evan's opinion, the effects of alcohol are on a more case-by-case -case basis, and I would agree, and different drinks do not produce different effects unless the drinker thinks they will. Now, here's my take related to this. Temperament has more to do with it than anything, I think. Some people are happy drunks. Some are mean drunks. Some tap out early. Some are down to party all night. Everybody's different. Now, here's a fun fact. Andre the Giant, former pro wrestler and actor, holds the unofficial record for most beers consumed in a single sitting. Generally, he is considered the greatest beer drinker in recent history, as many different people have shared stories about his insane drinking capabilities. And since his death, we, we miss him very much, uh, nobody has ever really been able to top these feats. So here are some of them. According to former pro wrestler Hulk Hogan, Andre allegedly consumed 102 12-ounce beers in less than an hour while at an airport waiting for a flight. But that wasn't even his personal best. According to two other pro wrestlers and friends of Andre, Mike Graham and Dusty Rhodes, Andre the Giant consumed 156 12-ounce beers over a about five or six hour period. He was also known to drink multiple cases of beer on long car rides or down multiple bottles of wine before wrestling matches. And I even heard one anecdote that he, he drank so much one night at a hotel that he collapsed. I mean, obviously, you know, this guy can drink a lot, but... He just pushed himself past his limit, collapsed, and uh, nobody could 
lift him because the guy's so huge. They had to get like six guys to haul him into an elevator and take him to his room. I mean, imagine that. Andre the Giant's passed out. What are you going to do? Yeah, I can imagine. Get a forklift. I think it just has to do with your weight, if you think about it. Cause I knew an obese guy in college who I heard he had like 50 or 60 drinks in one night. Wow, now that's impressive. But, but he, he was just so heavy. He was so he was tall and very and like pretty obese. So. so what about ancient and pre-industrial beer production? Beer likely was invented over 5,000 years ago in what is now southern Iraq. Although there's some... That say it was in China a few thousand years before that. It's up for debate. It was accidentally discovered, likely as a result of leaving grain out in the rain and tasting what the sprout produced. The Sumerians loved beer and even attributed attributed it to a goddess. Once the Babylonians took over, it was highly regulated in the famous Hammurabi Code. There were 20 different types recognized by the law. Really? Mm -hmm. By about 3000 BC, beer was the everyday drink of Egyptians in every social stratum. In fact, that was one of their payment methods. In addition to being tasty and creating good vibes, it was also safer and healthier than water since they didn't filter or sanitize their water. Brewing was actually woman's work until the Middle Ages. Now, as I understand it about early beer, it was more like modern-day IPAs. Like, it's thicker. It was more of like a meal than it was like actual, like, liquid. I mean, obviously it was still liquid, but it was heartier, I should say, is probably the word. More calories? Yeah, more calories, a little bit denser and... That was a big portion of their diet right there. Interesting. The Greeks and Romans loved their wine and disdained beer, so it never really caught on there in ancient times. However, the barbarians of Spain, Gaul, and Germany were good at brewing beer. After Rome fell to barbarians, Western European cultures melted together to a great deal, and beer managed to become a part of civilized culture. Following St. Benedict's lead, many monasteries were formed and took to brewing in order to support themselves and be hospitable to travelers. And I didn't even mean it, but the Benedict option always comes up in our episodes. Every time. Every time. By the early 800s, the first European full-scale brewing operation was established by monks in Switzerland. Before hops were used in brewing, gruit was the source of bitterness and flavor. Gruit was the mixture of herbs that preserved and flavored the beverage. In the 1100s, partly inspired by nun and botanist St. Hildegard of Bingen, hops took over. Central Europe became the center of beer production. Hops helped to preserve beer for longer storage. Now let's give you a rundown of uh, the history of prohibition efforts. As early as 1158, governments were regulating the beverage. The most famous of such laws was the Reinheitsgebot in 1516. But they were about controlling quality and enforcing protectionism rather than condemning drinking and limiting the people's ability to do so. Prohibition efforts in America are famous. Before the 18th Amendment, however, there were various laws and movements at local and state levels to discourage or outlaw alcohol, and it wasn't until the 18th Amendment that we saw federal intervention there. In 1851, Maine prohibited the sale of all alcoholic beverages. Uh, By 1855, 12 states had totally prohibited alcohol. However, these laws were unpopular and led to riots. Also, dry states could do nothing about interstate alcohol transport, thank the Constitution for that, and enforcement was difficult. The Women's Christian Temperance Movement was formed in 1873 to advocate for complete prohibition. It produced the infamous Carrie Nation, also known as the Hatchet Granny, who smashed saloons to pieces with her axe. Wouldn't want to mess with her. She was arrested 30 times for violent conduct and property damage. However, the Anti-Saloon League, another prohibitionist group, formed in 1893 to pressure politicians for abolition of alcohol. They worked within the system and through public relations campaigns, a.k.a. propaganda, to change public opinion. Check out the cartoons from this era for some entertainment. I remember seeing some really good ones in high school um, that, yeah, just portrayed... Guys drinking as, like, just total losers and, like, abandoning their kids, killing their kids and stuff like that. Really uh, far-out things. Uh, They used a lot of emotional tactics involving destitute children and abusive fathers. Uh, An unknown fact to us was that in 1920, two doctors at the 15th International Congress Against Alcoholism in Washington seriously considered exterminating drinkers, but settled on just sterilizing them (laughs) and putting them in concentration camps because that was much better than, I guess, outright killing them. Uh, So they did that instead. And of course, this was never implemented, but damn, that it was even brought up and people were like, hmm, yeah, I'll consider that. Pretty scary. As we alluded to in episode seven on taxation, uh, 10 out of 10 would recommend 
it would be a very good use of your time. Go check us out on YouTube and BitChute. Forty uh, percent of American tax revenue was excise taxes on alcohol back in the day. However, the passage of the 16th Amendment, which allowed nationwide income taxes, opened the door for freeing, quote unquote, the nation from the scourge of alcoholism. In 1917, the Congress had 140 drives out of 204 uh, Democrats and 138 drives out of 200 Republicans. So a majority of both parties supported prohibition. Also, beer was associated with Germany, which was the enemy in the war effort. Despite the presidential veto, the 18th Amendment was ratified in early 1919, which outlawed the manufacture, sale, and transportation of alcohol. It's worth noting that at the time, 33 out of 48 states were already dry. Prohibition lasted from 1919 to 1933. It was highly ineffective due to smuggling, home brewing, difficulty of enforcement, and corruption. Liquor surged in popularity while beer declined, quite contrary to what these people would have liked to see. Speakeasies popped up by the thousands in most major cities. In fact, I think there is reportedly 10,000 of them in Chicago alone. 10,000? Yeah, in New York City, too, about that many. Organized crime grew, profiting from the sale of illegal alcohol. The term bootlegger came from this era, as alcohol smugglers would often hide liquor in the leg of their boots. Most people turned a blind eye to this until the gangs started shooting each other up. FDR ran in 1929 on a repeal platform and won huge. The 21st Amendment repealed Prohibition in 1933, and that was that. This amendment allowed states to continue to be dry, and many chose to do so for decades after. I believe Mississippi was the last to allow alcohol in their state, I think, in the 60s or something. Wow. The last holdout. Yep. Uh, Even today, there are dry counties within states, but no dry states. The effects of Prohibition were almost entirely negative. It caused organized crime to balloon out of control, which led to crackdowns on gun ownership, Like the NFA, Daniel is still mad about that. Still mad even to this day. (laughs) It destroyed America's beer and wine industries, caused an increase in sugary drinks, and increased the popularity of spirits. It was about as successful as the war on drugs has been. I wasn't going to go there, but I see. I will go there. (laughs) (laughs) I will always go there. Very unsuccessful led to organized crime. Same thing happening today. I rest my case. Anyways, before Prohibition, there were 1,392 brewers, but after... Only 164 were around, which meant that they were operating illegally, if you think about it. This led, due to the effects of monopolization, on the diminishing quality of American beer. And let me say, it was so bad that to have Americans resort to sugary drinks instead of beer. I would argue sugary drinks have had a worse impact on America than beer. And do you think that we would have the current obesity crisis today if it hadn't been for that? Do you think we would have adopted sugary drinks as much as we have? Or would it have happened later? It still would have happened. Well, I, I say um, sugary drinks definitely contribute to the obesity epidemic. I don't think that's much, that contentious to say. But it's hard to say what would have happened. But before Prohibition, the average American was drinking beer. And they liked their beer in the traditional kind of bitter tasting way. What came from Germany. We're going to talk about that later with sourness of beer. Yes. But they didn't have to have such sweet drinks. But after Prohibition, like all these American beer companies, they had to make their drinks taste more sugary in order to appeal to the American people because they got a new sweet tooth. Sure. That's what I say. I think it became like a snowball effect. I'm not sure if we could have stopped sugary drinks from being adopted during the like fast food revolution. Oh, yeah. But that was way after, wasn't it? That was way after. But it kind of makes me wonder, like, if there hadn't been prohibition, would we never have gotten that sweet tooth? Would we just have been instead serving beer at McDonald's, like in Pulp Fiction, where he says, and in, and in Paris, you can buy beer at McDonald's. Mm-hmm. You know, maybe that would have been our future if we hadn't had prohibition. Who knows? Let's talk about modern beer production. Most modern breweries are enormous, but the process is very similar to what you would do at home, besides the scope and uh, a few differentiating ingredients. The addition or substitution of key ingredients combined with the quality of the ingredients used gives beers different signature tastes. Machines take over many of the steps, and human effort is much lower in, um, in these factories and these operations than in years past. Compared to pre-industrial brewing, modern breweries use better equipment and put a higher emphasis on sanitation. Very important. The use of stainless steel instead of wood helps to mitigate unwanted yeast and bacterial growth in the beer. Also, it's important to sterilize all the equipment regularly, especially in home brewing. 
It's worth noting that old school beers, especially in Germany, were intentionally made sour through contamination. People prized that signature taste, and it didn't make them sick. You've never been to Germany, right? No, sadly, no. We were gonna, and then uh, COVID happened. Yeah, but man, if you go to Munich, there's this place called the Hofbrauhaus. Okay. It's very famous. It's actually run by the government, but it's really good beer. It's just a huge beer hall. Very, what do you call that part of Germany? Very Bavarian. Oh, yes. Well, yeah. It's great. uh... When when I was there, they had like a little German band there playing, like a guy on tuba and nice (laughs) trumpets and stuff. It was so cool. It was pretty lit. It was really lit. And they actually, if you go to specialty grocery stores, you can buy their beer. Yeah. All like even in America. No, you know what? Um, the land of of my ancestors is uh, is Bavaria. In that area, they make a beer called Erdinger Weiss beer. It's from Erding. Okay, that's that's the area, and um, you can find it at places that sell like, international beer. Yeah, and that's some good stuff right there. Let me tell you. Mm. Yeah, I miss German beer. It's really good for stuff. My, for my little trip there, it was so good. Despite the sweetening of the American palate. Sour ales are making a comeback on the craft brew scene. Please watch the YouTube video in the description called Townsend's and Historic Beer for more fascinating insights. Fun little fact here. uh, I have done some maintenance work in an unknown brewery in an undisclosed location, but I did do some work there, uh, and I have continued to do some work over the years, every now and then. What insights do you have? Uh, Not too many. But even in small-scale operations, which this was a more small-scale operation, it wasn't Anheuser-Busch or any of these big corporations, Uh, even in a small-scale setting, there are huge pieces of equipment in these places. They're brewing giant batches at a time. So you've got stainless steel tanks in there, multiple stainless steel tanks, a minimum like 15-foot or 20-foot diameter, like 30, 40 feet tall. I mean, these things are huge because... They got to get their money's worth, you know. It's got it's a t- big time investment to do all this, so you might as well brew a ton all at once, drain it, clean it, and then brew the next batch, you know. So if you've got multiple flavors that you're trying to produce, maybe for a week straight, fill all those tanks with that batch, make it all, bottle it all through an assembly line, and then you'll start making the next one, and you'll just keep it, and it'll it'll have a, a long shelf life, relatively long shelf life, so you can just stage it, and then you can make the next batch. That's really smart. I didn't realize they were that large of an operation. Yes, yes. Uh, and, yeah, even with these small, smaller-scale places, you know, they're going to make some and then store it or go ahead and distribute it and then go ahead and make a different batch. And so they're constantly changing, you know, because if you're just a one-trick pony, you're probably not going to sell much because everybody's got a different taste, different palate. And sometimes people just want to change it up, and you want to get in on the seasonal game because some people really like a different flavor a different time of year because uh, they're trying to pair it with different foods and things like that that they only eat at a certain time. So you want to you know, keep your finger on the pulse. And so that's why it's important to kind of change your your business model to accommodate that. So that's why you got to have big tanks and you got to go through multiple, run multiple batches through those tanks. So I think that's, that's pretty cool. And it, there's a lot of little ins and outs that go into it that you wouldn't think. But if you get a chance to tour a local brewery wherever you're at, I would definitely recommend you do that because a lot of that stuff is similar to what they do on the large scale. It's just fascinating stuff. Speaking of touring, a few years ago I actually did go on a tour of a Budweiser plant. Really? I won't say which. Now, how was that? It was great, and it made me want to be involved in the process. Yeah? Did they take you through, like, the whole thing? Were there any secret places they wouldn't let you look at? No. Wow. I don't believe so. That is pretty cool. And they had something similar to giant tanks and Yeah, huge tanks and all these pipes going everywhere and conveyors and bottles going past you. Yep. Yeah, forklifts running everywhere, moving pallets of beer or maybe. I, I see I wonder in those big plants how they, they do that because where I was they would just kind of stack them onto a it was not like a wooden pallet, but it was a specialized type of pallet. But then they would just have forklift traffic going in and out, moving it, stacking it, staging it. It's probably different based on each plant. But if you look at the other YouTube video linked in the description, the Budweiser plant in Columbus, Ohio is featured. They produce 10 million barrels of beer annually, and note that a barrel is a large quantity. It's not just one bottle. Yeah, so that's a ton of beer. And they only supply their region, like the upper Midwest, essentially. Yeah, so just imagine how much the entirety of 
Budweiser is making every year. It's interesting to see how much how such a large indu- industrial operation works. The crazy thing is that despite being so large, they still produce beer in a batch process, just as you would do at home. There is a way to make beer in a continuous process. The a continuous process is the way they make most things in factories with a constantly running machine and conveyor belt and no breaks in production. But it does not produce a consistent product. It can have more bacterial growth and it's inflexible to consumer demand. With the advent of globalization, anyone in a first world country can have pretty much any alcoholic flavor and brand they want. Do you like Mexican beers? Just go to your local supermarket and get a Dos Equis or Corona. You want Asian beers for some reason? Maybe try a Whole Foods near you. Any European beer is available as well. We are indeed a spoiled nation. Indeed we are. Now, have you ever had an Asian beer? I haven't. I just assumed it's inferior. That might be unfair. It might be unfair. Some may call you racist for that. I won't, though. I will just say that um, it's unusual to find them, at least in our neck of the woods. You're going to find either cheap domestics or Mexican beer. That's generally what people are going after. And then, of course, you got your your German type stuff and maybe some some European. But generally, Asian beer is not on the menu. Asian beer is not in people's sphere. You know, they're just not thinking about it. But I think I did have some one time and it was pretty good. So I'm not going to say that it's inferior. I don't have enough information. But I, you know what, now that you said that, I'm going to make an effort to try some Asian beer and see how it is. Now, here's a question for you. Which beers are produced the most throughout the world? And what are some statistics surrounding those? Well, we have the answer here. Anheuser-Busch is the largest beer company in the world with $52.3 billion in sales. That's per year? Yes. Goodness gracious. They were followed uh, by Heineken, Asahi, which is Japanese, Kirin, which is also Japanese, Molson Coors, now, they make Coors and uh, Miller beer lines. Uh, Carlsberg, which is Danish, and Thai beverage. You can guess where that comes from. Obviously, lots of non-Americans drink, too. In America, the most popular beers, uh, from number one all the way down to number 10, are Bud Light, of course, number one. Coors Light, Budweiser, Miller Light, Corona Extra, Michelob Ultra, Modelo Especial, Natural Light, Bush Light, and Bush. Great lineup right there. Other notable mentions are PBR. Hey, yeah, that's my drink of choice. Yangling, Heineken, Blue Moon, Dos Equis, and Guinness. Americans are very cultured when it comes to their beer. They really uh, they really do take it to heart, I think. It's very, very dear to us. In 2020, the average American of drinking age consumed 26.1 gallons of beer and cider in a year. Yeah, I don't know if I believe that statistic. 26.1. How many cans would that be? How many cans is a gallon? All right, Evan, look it up real quick. What's the answer? There are 128 fluid ounces in a gallon. Okay, 128 fluid ounces in a gallon. And that means there's 12 fluid ounces in a can of beer. So let's just, uh, it's not quite even, so let's say 10 beers in a gallon. Okay, so they're drinking 260 beers in a year. That's on average. That's an average. I would say that's accurate. Because some people don't drink any, but some people probably drink way more than that. 260 is a lot. Yeah, that's like four beers a week or so. Four or five beers a week. I think that's fair. I think that's fair. Some people drag the average up. Yeah. Uh, About 75% of Americans are 21 or older. 82% of beer consumed by Americans is domestic. The American beer industry sells more than $100 billion annually. 36% of Americans don't drink. Of those that do, about 40% prefer beer over other drinks, compared to 30% for wine and 30% for spirits. So now let's talk about craft beers and home brews. In 2012, 90% of domestic beer production was done by Anheuser-Busch and Miller Coors, an astronomical figure. As with most sectors in America, consolidation has been the norm since the Reagan era, and this is bad news for the country at large, in my opinion. You may disagree. From 2002 to 2007, employment in brewing actually decreased despite an expanding economy. Now, does this mean we need to bring antitrust cases against Anheuser-Busch? Well, not just Anheuser-Busch. It needs to come to every industry and cause a, a big a shakeup. A big shakeup. Well, I certainly think we need a shakeup in the tech industry. I think most people agree with that. But 
I, you know, I, you don't really hear too much about Anheuser Busch and like them having a monopoly controlling everything, but they kind of do. It's and not I, a monopoly, but it's just such a large portion of the market. It is. I, I wouldn't mind seeing them broken up. And also, I have a issue with them uh, recently. Like within the last year, I think there was some controversy involving one of my favorite beers, as I mentioned earlier, PBR. I know a lot of people rag on PBR, but you can get out of town and stop listening to this podcast for all I care if you don't like PBR. If you don't like PBR, please continue listening. <laughs> but anyway, I feel very strongly about it. So when I heard the news that uh, I believe it was Miller Coors, was, they were the ones who were bottling PBR for them. They had a contract. And they said, hey, your contract's just about up. Either you let us buy you out or we're not going to bottle for you anymore. And I felt that like that was really shady and that was just really rude of them because PBR is great. I love it. And um, I don't want to see them go away. But the big the big man was trying to step on all over the little guy. So I got to root for the little guy on this one. All right. So despite an expanding economy, this is before the economy crashed, the employment in brewing was actually going down very slightly. However, the trend has shifted dramatically since 2007. Between 2008 and 2016, the number of brewing establishments increased sixfold, so six times. And brewery employment went up 120%. Why was this? It was the unexpected rise of the craft beer movement. If you live in any city or metropolitan area, even a lot of small towns, you probably notice the rise of small craft brewing centers. Craft breweries are defined as small, independent breweries that usually are less mechanized and more labor-intensive. Craft breweries are less economically efficient and theoretically shouldn't have come into existence at all. They use more labor for less product. The first cause of their rise, though, is simply consumer tastes. Many people are tired of the low-quality, mass-produced piss water, as Evan calls it, that the big names give us, and that's partially true. And they are willing to pay more money for higher quality and different, better tastes. People also feel good supporting small local businesses, Oftentimes, a craft brewery provides a nice ambiance for the local community. And I definitely agree with that, even if I'm not a big fan of the craft brew scene. Some of the coolest places I've been to, with like the coolest atmosphere, have been local breweries. Since 2010, about 5% of market volume has gone from uh, large companies to smaller brewers, from 12% to 17%. There is still a long way to go, but the trajectory looks promising. Home brewing was legalized in 1978. According to the American Home Brewers Association, there are 1.1 million home brewers in America, with a huge surge in the last four years. They tend to be middle-aged and above average in wealth and life stability. They produced 1.4 million barrels of beer in 2017, a surprising 1% of all beer production. That's impressive. Just brewing it at your house all these people together, 1% of all beer production, that's worldwide or U.S.? In the U.S. That's still, that's pretty cool considering how big Anheuser-Busch and Miller Coors are. This is a fun hobby that someone could get into. Maybe Evan will try to get more into it soon. Who knows? Tempted. Tempted. Now, have you ever had any homebrew? I have not. Really? I've had some. And in my experience, it tastes a little bit like celery. <laughs> but, and it's not just this the person who I got it from. This is pretty often when I taste stuff from local, like, brew houses and, like, these experimental type deals that are non, you know, like, that are not from the the big names. It, a lot of the time it tastes like vegetables to me. And it, I got to try to find the right one. Usually if I get anything that's really light, it tastes like that. But if I go for, like, a lager, usually it's great, perfect, no celery taste. But homebrew, it, I don't know what it is. And it's, like, batch after batch, year after year, totally different different process, different batches, it tastes like vegetables. So that's just my taste. Well, Maybe some, your experience is different. Some craft beers actually use vegetables. I don't so. believe these did, so I don't know how that got in there. <laughs> but it kind of just made me scratch my head a little bit. But in general, it was good. And a lot of the time when you homebrew, you can make the alcohol content way higher, you know, so you can kind of fiddle with it. So you can get a certain taste that tastes like a, a normal lager beer, but it's like, oh, man, you can get turned up on this. So you got to be careful when you're drinking those homebrews. Now let's go over the morality of drinking alcohol. Which religions ban it? Hmm, let's find out. Is drinking alcohol immoral? That depends on your philosophical or religious system. If you're a Jainist, you don't drink beer because you think it's immoral to kill any living thing, including yeast. 
Hardcore. It, that is very hardcore. If you're dogmatically opposed to gluten, then beer is sinful to you unless you make it from non-gluten sources. Are there really religions that don't like gluten? I was just making a joke about the gluten-free movement. Oh, I see. Well, it does seem like a religion sometimes. It's a little bit dogmatic to some people. However, the issue with alcohol usually has less to do with its ingredients and more to do with its effects, understandably. Alcohol obviously impairs judgment, inhibits motor skills, and suppresses reason, at least at a certain point. One question is, at what point does this occur? To many, having one sip of beer impairs your judgment. However, the law in America and most people concede that this does not actually occur, but only if you've had, quote, too much to drink. This, of course, is different based on the person, but the legal system defines a blood alcohol content, or BAC, at which point driving becomes driving under the influence, or DUI. Uh, while no such quantitative standard exists within religions which tolerate some alcohol consumption, we'll get into that, it can be defined as the point at which you lose control of your actions, words, and thoughts. To be drunk is to make a mockery of your, of your humanity by turning yourself into a mere animal because reason, that which separates you from the beasts, is gone. An interesting point there. There are many religions in the world that forbid alcohol. Islam, Baha'i, Buddhism, Jainism, Sikhism, and arguably Hinduism have absolute prohibitions on alcohol for their followers. The Quran is unambiguously against one cracking open a cold one with the boys, as we just did. Alcohol is a temptation from Satan, according to them. Baha'i, Buddhism, and Sikhism prohibit the use of intoxicants and drugs because it inhibits clear thought and reason. Hinduism, while having no universal texts, does condemn alcohol consumption in its major texts. Some Protestant denominations have historically been prohibitionists or abstentionists, meaning they don't drink but they don't condemn the practice. Since the 19th century, prohibitionism uh, was especially prevalent among Methodists and Evangelical Christians, and these groups helped pass the 18th Amendment. It's also worth noting that Baptists are also uh, very much against alcohol, and Mormons as well, and, and coffee too. They yeah. don't do coffee. I like the consistency. Judaism uses wine in many of its traditions though grape juice is usually permitted as a substitute. They take a moderationist position, but American Jews have a more negative view of alcohol than average. Roman Catholicism, Eastern Orthodoxy, Anglicanism, Lutheranism, and various other Protestants have a moderationist approach. This means that they condone drinking, but being drunk is sinful. In Catholicism, being drunk is considered a mortal sin because you are relinquishing your reason and becoming animalistic. Ancient religions often had a favorable view on drunkenness. In Greece, the cult of Dionysus used wine to bring participants to a frenzy. Uh, he was the god of a good time, after all. The related Orphic mysteries used alcohol to connect to their spiritual side, as opposed to their accursed bodies. Rome's uh, Bacchanalia festivals were also a spectacle of drunkenness and revelry. We can imagine what happened there. They were actually outlawed by the Senate a few times because they, they were too got... crazy. <laughs> I can imagine. Let's talk about our favorite beers. And is beer the best alcoholic beverage? Short answer, yeah. Short answer, no. So I'm an unsophisticated brute who likes Budweiser and can't taste much of a difference between high-quality and low-quality beers, only between the types of brew. Despite this, I can be classy. I like wine most of all because there's no carbonation to upset my stomach. And it has a smooth and relaxing effect on me. It's not sudden, like liquor. Yes. And it just doesn't, I don't know, it just feels smooth to me. And it's a happy kind of s sensation. However, I do enjoy beer and liquor, most notably whiskey. Beer goes well with hearty American dishes. That's one thing, that wine just, like your standard dish. I mean, if it's got any, like, fried food in it, it probably won't go well with that. Yeah, I'm not sure ex what exact types of wine go best with chicken nuggets. Oh, pizza. it's white white wine. Oh, really? <laughs> it's based on the color of the meat. If it's if it's white meat, or you, oh. you drink white wine. If it's like red meat, like beef, then you would get red wine. Oh, now that is something I didn't know. But if you're know. eating like fried chicken, I don't know if wine is appropriate. Don't try to make it classy. No, no, just just admit that you're just eating fried chicken. You know, out of a KFC bucket. It's all good. We all do it. <laughs> now I am much more of a beer drinker than Evan, both in variety and in quantity. I don't like the craft or IPA scene much, but I 
will happily consume brews both foreign and domestic. Some of my favorites include Sam Adams, Corona, Modelo, especially Modelo Especial. See what I did there? <laughs> Yingling. Newcastle is pretty good. That's uh, English beer, I believe. PBR, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, Bud and Bud Light and Michelob Ultra. And what we're drinking today, Foster's. So I have, um, I try to get a little international going on. But um, I I know people who are way more into beer and knowing all the different types. And they've tried everything more so than me. So I would say I'm kind of middle of the road. I probably tried more than you have, but certainly not an expert. So let's go over the takeaways. Brewing and drinking beer have been an integral part of European, Middle Eastern, and Egyptian culture for millennia, not including the Islamic part of Middle Eastern and Egyptian culture. Beer comes in a wide variety of flavors and forms, but is simple enough to be made at home. Alcohol has many bad effects on individuals and societies, especially when consumed excessively, and many religions outright condemn it. Over a third of Americans don't drink. There have been many efforts throughout history to eliminate it altogether. Yeah, not even just in our country, but uh, regulate it around the world. Despite this, beer isn't going anywhere. It's here to stay. It is produced globally at unfathomable volumes. Lastly, RIP Andre the Giant. He will be missed. What are some lingering questions? Let me first ask, is craft beering the way of the future or only a fad? Will the big brands just adapt and take over that base? Probably. They'll probably. Well, I think we've already seen some of that going on. Ciders have really grown, and so have seltzers. And, you know, White Claws are synonymous with, the, you know, frat boy college parties and, you know, white girls going out uh, for a night on the town. But even Bud is coming out with seltzers now. And they've had the like the strawberitas for a long time. I think that's what they call them. And other type margarita things that are made by Budweiser. So wh- these guys have enough money and they have enough reach to where they can keep their finger on the pulse of the market very easily. And so anytime there's a new trend, the heck, they're on social media. They're doing polls with people. They're letting people sample things. They're trying new things. They got probably a huge R&D department. So it's very unlikely that they're will be a fad that overtakes them and leaves them in the dust. I really don't think that that's possible. I think they will always, almost always adapt. They've got too many resources not to. Unfortunately, I agree. Yeah. I think it's more of a fad. I don't think it'll last. Yeah. Uh, will drinking per capita increase or decrease in the next decade? It depends on how long Corona apocalypse lasts, <laughs> I think. What's, what's weird is in the past decade, actually, drinking per capita has gone down slightly. Over the last like, decade. Yeah, past few decades, it's been steadily going down per person. I wonder if they're just trading one vice for another. Like maybe they're just they're not drinking as much, but they're doing more crack. <laughs> maybe I, mean, I don't know. <laughs> That's maybe an extreme example, but uh, oh, okay, maybe a not so extreme example would be marijuana use because that's becoming more over the last ten years. That has seen increased legalization in other states. So maybe some have traded alcohol for weed. I mean, who knows? I'd like to see a study on that. I'd say it'd be about the same. That's my guess. Will our taste change to be more cultured now that we've done all this research? I definitely, as I said earlier, want to try some Asian beers now. So I'm going to expand my horizons there. What about you? I think I'm going to try some different beers. I don't, I don't know if I've ever had a one of the Pilsners or Lagers. Oh, yeah. Well, maybe if you, since you like this, uh, the yeah. Fosters so much, we'll try the Pale Ale next time. Yeah. I've it, never had IPA. I'd like to try it, see what it's about. There's a lot of different ones. I would say if you do try it, try multiple ones and maybe get like a, some samples, like a flight. You know, you get four different ones and try each one, see what you like, because it's it's unlikely you'll like the very first one you get. Will either of us try home brewing? I think Evan's a big contender for that one. I don't think I'll try it, but I think you will. You know, I'm actually considering more making wine. It's easier. Okay. But I, I would still count that for yeah. sure. You know, I'm... I would consider making beer, except that I don't drink all that much, and I don't want to just have, like, 20 bottles of beer. <laughs> yeah, and then it go to waste. Yeah. It is also, you, you have to purchase a lot of equipment to get started in homebrew. You don't have to purchase as much to make wine? Mm-mm. You just need a pressure container, really, and some grapes. 
and like some valves. So that's it. But with homebrew, you got to buy all the hops and the specialized grains, and also like a a little pressure valve thing. Yeah. Some specialty, like oh, you have to measure measure the specific gravity of the mixture if you really want to get fancy. And wow. Yeah, that does sound a little more complicated than making some wine. That's all for today's show. Join us again next time for even more ancient wisdom. Cheers.